Hi everyone, in this video we'll go over inferential statistics and we're going to move past descriptive stats into significance testing. When we run experiments, we draw a sample from a bigger population, so college freshmen from the broader U.S. population. But our purpose in research is not just wanting to describe our sample, but wanting to make conclusions on the bigger population. So we use sample statistics from our sample to do so. And we use those to make conclusions about population parameters. We know that all samples are different, and if you do a study over and over again by getting multiple samples, your results will be slightly different each time. The extent to which these statistics vary is referred to as your sampling error. So when we talk about the purpose of null hypothesis significance testing, we can think about it in two ways. First, there is a relationship in the population, and the relationship in the sample reflects this. This is our alternative hypothesis. The second is there is no relationship in the population, and the relationship in the sample reflects only sampling error. This is our null hypothesis. So with NHST, you have to look at your data and decide between these two interpretations. The steps for NHST starts with always assuming that the null hypothesis is true. So you start with the assumption that there are no differences. Then from the data, you determine how likely the sample relationship would be if the null hypothesis were true. If it's extremely unlikely that you found this relationship under the assumption that the null is true, then you reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis. So this says, yes, there's a difference between your groups and your experiment. But if the relationship you found wouldn't really be that unlikely under the assumption that the null is true, then you retain the null hypothesis of no differences. Um, another term for this is failing to reject the null hypothesis. The statistic you use to make that decision is a p-value. I briefly brought up p-values previously, um, but they're actually a pretty difficult concept to understand. It's the likelihood of the sample result if the null hypothesis were true. So low values mean that it's pretty unlikely that your result would occur under the null hypothesis. We set our alpha criterion to be 0.05 most of the time. So if there's a 5% chance or less of a result being as extreme as the sample result, then we reject the null hypothesis. This is where you get p is less than 0.05. So something is statistically significant if your p-value is less than alpha, so less than 0.05. If it's greater than a 5% chance, or 0.05, then we fail to reject the null hypothesis. This doesn't mean that we prove the null hypothesis, it just means that we didn't have compelling evidence to reject it. A couple notes about p-values, they are, they are not the probability the null hypothesis is true, and they are not the probability the results occurred by chance. So definitely don't say those kinds of things when you talk about p-values. Think of it in this way. So if the null hypothesis were true, a sample result being this extreme would occur 2% of the time, assuming our p-value is 0 0.02. So it's the probability of seeing data that extreme if the null were true. 0 0.05 is our mark. If it's below 0 0.05, it's significant. If it's not, then it's not significant. So a p-value of 0.24 would not be significant. 0 0.01, however, is less than 0 0.05, so that would be considered significant. P of 0 0.5 would not be significant. A lot of people glance too quickly sometimes and will think 0 0.5 is actually 0 0.05, but be careful when you look at p-values because it can be kind of deceiving sometimes. 0.5 is way higher than 0.05. P-values can also be really tiny, so less than 0.001, which is definitely significant. If you see a p-value of exactly 0.05, it's technically not less than 0.05, so we would consider that to be not significant. And 0.049 is essentially the same number, but it's technically lower than 0.05, so we would consider that to be significant. 0 0.05 is definitely an arbitrary number, and there are a lot of criticisms about p-values, but that's for kind of a more advanced statistics class, so for now, just get used to interpreting p-values um, in this way as our main inference tool. 
Okay, so we've done descriptive stats in the last video, so let's get into doing some hypothesis testing. The first one um, from the t-test family is a one sample t-test. This is where you compare one variable, so one sample mean to a hypothetical population mean. We set up our null hypothesis to be no difference, so sample mean um, is equal to the population mean. And our alternative hypothesis is specified to be that the sample mean is simply not equal to the population mean. In order to find out our p-value for this test, we have to calculate a certain test statistic first, and that's called t or t-statistic. In future classes, you'll learn how to actually do this by hand, um, most likely, and it involves looking at critical values in a table from a book um, that allows you to classify whether an effect is sufficiently large enough or not. But for now, I'll just show you how to do it in JASP. Okay, so now we'll go um, ahead and look at how to do a one sample t-test in JASP. So go ahead and download the Zeppo CSV file from um, this module, and we'll use that data set to do this test. Okay, so we'll go ahead and open up JASP now. So I'll go through and open up our data set like before. Computer browse. And we're working with Zeppo, so I'm just going to open that. And here's our data view, um, like before. We have ID numbers, rows or people, and then we have our one sample, um, so our sample means or sample um, vector, which we would calculate a mean. Um, it's labeled X here, and so we have 20 observations. We can start by doing descriptive statistics like we did before. We'll pretty much always start out with descriptive statistics on every test that we do. Um, so we can take our X variable, shoot it over, and down to statistics, just kind of make it calculate everything, mean, median mode, um, variance and range. So we have our descriptive stats table here. And then we'll just also have it kick out distribution plots and a box plot. Um, and, you know, we've already done all this before. And so that pretty much covers our descriptive stats. So we'll scroll back up and we'll just minimize this section. So now we're going to tack on another section right below that. So for one sample t-test, it'll be under this t-test box. And we're going to choose one sample t-test. And it's nice. Now in our workflow, we have our descriptive stats and it tacked on our inferential test right below it. Okay, so it's going to be the same. We're going to plug the x variable over there. Um, we want a student test, so kind of keep all these the same. Your alternative hypothesis is not equal to, so keep that the same. Um, and we can see it already kind of calculated here on the right side. Um, but for a one sample t-test, we want to be mindful on what our test value is, so what are we comparing it against. So if these are test scores, maybe we want to say um, that hypothetically the population test score is 50%. And we want to see if our sample is greater than the population mean, which would be 50%. So we can, under this test value, just change this value to 50. Hit enter, um, and it'll update this one sample t-test. Um, so here we can say... Our p-value is 0 0.001 or less than 0 0.001. That's less than 0 0.05, so this is significant. So we can say that, yes, because our mean's up here, 72, that's definitely bigger than 50. And we have the test to um, back that up. So yeah, our sample mean is statistically significant, and it's higher than the population mean, in this case, 50. And it even gives you a nice little note here. For all tests, the alternative hypothesis specifies that the population mean is different from 50. Okay, so um, in this table, we have T, D, F, and P. P is our p-value. Um, D, F is our degrees of freedom. And we'll use that in order to write up our results in APA style. We'll talk about that just a little bit at the end of the video. Um, and T, that's our um, test statistic, our T stat and it's 10.48, and we'll also use that um, to write up our results later on. But other than that, that is how you um, calculate um, and interpret a one sample t-test. And again, take all of these results on the right side, click the down arrow, copy it, and then paste that into um, a Microsoft Word type document. 
The next kind of t-test is a dependent samples t-test. This is also called a paired samples t-test. This is when you have a two-group experiment that's run within subjects. So participants participating in both groups. Here we specify our null as um, both conditions being equal to each other, and then our alternative hypothesis as the two conditions not being equal to each other. Okay, let's do an example of this in JASP. Okay, so now we'll go over the paired samples t-test or dependent samples t-test in JASP. Um, for this one, you'll need the chico.csv Excel file. So go ahead and download that from Canvas and we'll go ahead and get going. All right, so in JASP, we will open up our data. This one's going to be the Chico Excel file. And we have our data. So we have ID columns to each student, um, each row is a student. And we have um, two test grades. We have the first test that they took and the second test that they took. So grade test one and grade test two. Um, so we can easily tell just from looking at the data that this is going to be a dependent samples or paired samples um, that this experiment was run within subjects because if each row is a student, they have two measurements. So they did both test one and test two. Start off with descriptive stats. And what we'll do is we have two of these so we can just like highlight both of these and plug both of them over to the variables. And we'll quickly for plots, we can do distribution, box plots, and then stats, we'll beef that up a little bit. Median and mode, range and variance. Okay, we'll minimize that. And after it thinks a little bit, okay, so we have our descriptive stats for both um, grade test one, grade test two. Looking at the means, looks like test performance is higher in the second test than the first test. We have our histograms or distribution plots for grade test one. We have it for grade test two. Um, and we also have box plots. Um, these are plotted separately, but that's okay. So we have um, box plots for grade test one, grade test two. And now we can move on to our paired sample t-test. So under t-test, this one's gonna be paired samples, dependent samples, same thing. So we'll click that. And it's gonna ask for variable pairs. So likewise, in the descriptive stats section, um, we'll put this grade test one and plug that over, and then grade test two and plug that over. So notice that it looks just a little different um, for paired samples or repeated measures designs. It's going to say on the left side, what's the first value? On the right side, what's the second value? So it'll just automatically put it in the right order. Um, so just do test one over, test two over. So we're going to keep it as student. Um, all of these kind of default options are good. You can just kind of leave it at that. We also want to calculate an effect size. So we'll click effect size. And we have our paired samples t-test result here. Um, so kind of like the one sample t-test, we have a t-value, degrees of freedom, p-value, and we also have a Cohen's d-value here. Um, so we, you would use all of these when you're writing this up in APA style. And again, I'll show you that form at the end of the video. Um, so this is a student's t-test, and it's grade test one minus grade test two. And since grade test two is higher than test one, this test statistic will be negative. Um, so it's saying test one is lower than test two. If we were to reorder this, um, let me just show you real quick. So if we did test two first and then test one, then the contrast is gonna be grade two minus one. And since two is higher than one, we can say the T value is the exact same number, but now it's positive. So the sign just kind of tells you the order of the effect. P is less than 0 0.001, we know that's less than 0 0.05, and so we would reject the null hypothesis and say that yes, there is a statistically significant difference here. And our Cohen's d-value is 1.45, that's huge. Um, so we would classify this as a large effect. So that's how you calculate a paired samples t-test in JASP. And the final kind of t-test is an independent samples t-test. 
This is similar to a paired samples t-test, but now using a between subjects design. So people only participating in one condition or another. Our null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis is set up the same, um, in the same way. It's just that the math is a little different when you actually go and run the test. So let's go ahead and do this in JASP now. All right, so now we'll do um, an independent samples t-test in JASP. And we're going to use the Chico long CSV file. Um, so we're going to download that, and we'll use the long version of it. Open up our data. Chico long, open that up. OK, so you can tell that this is um, the same data set as the, the last example that we did, but it looks a little different. So this is going to be in long format. So instead of having each student and then test one and test two, we basically kind of move all of this data to the second column and shove it below so there's only one score variable. So now we have everyone's grade test one and then everyone's grade test two kind of stacked on top of each other. This type of format works better when you're doing an independent samples t-test. Um, so that's why I kind of already put that in that format for you guys, but we'll use this long version. Um, the descriptive stats, we will do score, move that over. And so since this is in long format, we still need to identify our two groups. But notice that if I go back to the data view, um, I've made this label here. So it's just the columns that used to be grade test one and test two. I just move that over here. And so we can split on that. And so we can split on test. So move that over to the split. And then it calculates as um, 58 here and 56 here. So it does split by it. And so we're just going to pretend for this example that this has um, been run um, between subjects when in reality it's a, uh, within subjects design. So you would run a paired sample t-test. But we'll just pretend it's between subjects for now, just to show you guys how to run an independent samples t-test. So maybe we can pretend this is um, grade test one, so classroom A and classroom B. Um, use your imagination, whatever you want to think of. Um, but we can go ahead and do our distribution and box plots again. And maybe they don't show up. Oh, there they are. Ah, OK. Mean, median, mode, range and variance. Okay, so now we have all our descriptive stats in order. Um, distribution plots for both, they should look the same. And then now I'll group the box plots together. The next thing is under t-test, now we'll do independent samples t-test. Okay, so now it's going to want your dependent variable first, which is the score. So we'll highlight score and move that over, move that over. Um, and then grouping variable, that's going to be like that split one. So it's going to want your the labels for your two conditions. So that's our test. So we'll add that to a grouping variable. All right. So leave all these parameters, um, leave all the defaults, and we'll click effect size. And here we go. So it's the same data. Um, so you would think that you would get the same result. But the math is a little different um, between when you calculate it as a paired sample t-test and an independent sample t-test. So in pretend land that this is a between subject subjects experiment, now our p-value is 0.499. So this would be non-significant. We would fail to reject the null hypothesis. We have our t-value here, our degrees of freedom, and then our Cohen's d. And we would use that to report an APA style. So we can always copy this over and move it to Microsoft Word. Um, but from this test result, we would conclude that there is no difference here um, between test 2 and test 1, even though the means are slightly higher in test 2. OK, so that's how you calculate an independent samples t-test in JASP. So when we have more than two groups in our factor, we use an analysis of variance, or ANOVA for short. 
So if we had three levels um, or more in our factor, we run an ANOVA. Here we can extend our null hypothesis and our alternative hypothesis. For our null, we have condition A is equal to B is equal to C. And then our alternative hypothesis is just that at least one of those is different from another. With ANOVAs, you get an F statistic instead of a T statistic. This is an omnibus test that tells you if there are any differences at all, but it doesn't specifically tell you where the differences are. For that, you perform post hoc testing. So while the overall model may be significant, you kind of break it down. You run all of the two group comparisons. So with three levels in our factor, you would run a t-test each time between A versus B, a t-test A versus C, and then a t-test for B versus C. You only run post hocs if your overall model is significant. If, you, um, if your overall ANOVA model is not significant, that means that you retain the null, and that means that all conditions are equal. And if they're equal to each other, there's really no point in breaking it down and running those post hoc tests. Um, so you only do it if your model is significant. All right, so let's go ahead and try this out with a between subjects and a repeated measures ANOVA and JASP. Okay, so we'll first run a between subjects ANOVA and JASP. Um, and we'll use this clinical trial CSV. So go ahead and download that from the module. Let me open up the data set. And we'll do clinical trial. All right, so we have our ID variables. Um, we have drugs, so whether they got placebo, Ainsley Free, Joy Zapam. Uh, we have therapy, whether they got no therapy or yes therapy. And then our dependent variable is mood gain. Um, so how did their mood change as a function of either therapy or drug or the combination of both? Okay, so we'll first start off with descriptives again. Okay, so we want mood gain as our DV here under variables. And we want drug in this case because we're running a between subjects ANOVA, so we need more than two conditions. The therapy condition just had therapy, no therapy, so that would be a t-test. But here we want to look at drug because that has three levels in that IV. So we'll highlight drug and put that under split. And again, I know you guys are probably sick of this, but distribution plots, box plots, mean, meaning, mode, range, and variance. So that'll take a few seconds to kind of to whip those up. Um, here we go. So now we have our three um, levels within our independent variable, and we're looking at mood gain. We got means and SDs for all three of those. We have histograms for each of our three conditions, and we have our box plots um, for each level of the drug. Okay, so between subjects, ANOVA will be under this ANOVA category. Um, and it's kind of cool because you can see t-test, two groups, ANOVA has more than two groups. Um, so that's a nice way to kind of conceptualize it as well. And it's just going to be this first one, uh, just ANOVA. All right, so now it's asking for our dependent variable. We know that is mood gain. So we'll highlight mood gain and click that over. And fixed factors, that's where you're going to put the drug. So we're going to highlight drug and move that over. Okay, so there's a lot of things that we can look at. Um, model, leave that the same. Assumption checks, leave that the same. Contrast, leave that the same. Um, post hoc test. So we do want post hoc test because um, that's how we know where the differences will be. So we'll highlight drug and move that over. And we can click effect size here for the post hoc tests. Okay, and there are a bunch of different corrections you can do. And this feeds into the idea that um, we have multiple testing. So when you're doing multiple comparisons, this can inflate your type one error rate. And so you need to statistically control for that. 
There are a bunch of different ways. Um, I think the most, I mean, they're all pretty common, but I've used Bonferroni in the past, so we'll just use that. And that will automatically correct our p-values so we don't have to worry about running multiple tests um, and having that kind of skew our inferences at all. Um, oh, take off two key there. So just Bonferroni um, and we'll highlight postdoc test. And that should be it for our Nova. So let's kind of check that out. We've already looked at our descriptives. And here we go. So here's our overall F statistic. This is our omnibus test. This shows us if there's any differences anywhere at all between these th three groups. Um, here we have two different degrees of freedoms. We have one that's associated with our model um, drug. And then we have another one that's associated with our residual. When you go to write this up in APA style, you will include both of these degrees of freedom. So make sure you pay attention to these two numbers. It will be this one listed first, followed by a comma, and then this one. Um, and again, we'll go over that at the end. We have mean squares, um, that's fine and dandy. Um, but then we have our F statistic. This is like our T statistic, but F is for ANOVA. Um, so we have our F statistic, and then we have our P value. P is less than 0 0.001, that's way below 0 0.05, so there is a significant overall difference between our three groups. So our overall ANOVA is significant. And then we have our post hoc test. So now that we know there is a different difference here, we need to kind of break that down and see where the differences are. And we can see... Um, and kind of look at our P, um, there's a subscript, B-O-N-F, that's Bonferroni. And so the difference between Angsy Free and Joy Pam, our P is 0 0.002, so there is a significant difference there. Um, between Angsy Free and Placebo, we see that the P value is 0.45, so there's no difference between Angsy Free and Placebo. We can kind of see that here, Angsy Free and Placebo, um, bars are pretty even there. And then our last one is Joyzepam versus placebo. P is less than 0 0.001, so there is a difference here. Um, so we can see that the difference is really um, because Joyzepam is higher than both Angsy Free and placebo, but no differences across between Angsy Free and placebo. Um, and so then we would report our T values and our P values for all of our postdoc testing. And, oh, it's a good note here that Cohen's D does not correct for multiple comparisons. Um, so keep that in mind and be a little cautious when interpreting these values as well. But our p-values are corrected. So that's how you run a between-subjects ANOVA and do subsequent post hoc testing in JASP. Okay, so the next thing, we'll do a within-subjects ANOVA or repeated measures ANOVA next. We'll use the same data set and we'll kind of pretend it's repeated measures um, now and we will use the clinical trial underscore y data set um, associated with this module so here kind of like the difference between pair t test and independent samples t test um, it's better to have the data kind of formatted a little differently so um, strung across rows or kind of stacked um, down in one single column so we will use this y data set for this one so go ahead and download that I will import that real quick. Clinical trial wide. All right, so it looks a little different. Um, I kind of cut out all the ID variables um, and the therapy, no therapy, just to kind of simplify things. So now instead of having one long column with all the mood gain variables, each one of these cells is a mood gain measurement. So now there's six people in this experiment, and we'll say that in this experiment, maybe um, in a totally randomized order, they would be on the placebo drug for a little bit, and then they would get angsty free for a little bit, and then they get joy -Z pam after that. So they would participate in all levels. So we'll just pretend that that happened in this experiment. Um, so now we have one row per person, and then each measurement um, in each column. Okay, so descriptive stats, just highlight all those, plug them over, distribution box plots, and median 
mode, variance and range. Okay, so now that we calculated that, um, kind of let that load here, we'll go to ANOVA, and it's just going to be the next one down from ANOVA, so repeated measures ANOVA. So that's for within subjects design, which we pseudo have here. So we'll click that. All right, so you see that it um, kind of looks a little different um, than the other one. Between subjects ANOVA is a lot easier to kind of plug and chug, um, but we'll kind of work our way through this here. So I'm going to call this factor one drug. So I'm just going to type that in. And level one, I'll type in placebo. Level two, I'll type in Yangzi free. And then level three, I'm going to type in Joyzepam. Okay, and so now I can go ahead and plug in all those variables down here. So I take placebo for the first one, move it over, Angzy free, and it'll know that's the second one, and then finally Joyzy Pam for the third one. In this example, it's going to be all um, totally within subjects, um, so we don't need any between subjects factors or covariates. We know we're going to leave. Um, the model, assumption checks, contrast the same. Post hoc tests. Um, it says drug because that's what we told that um, factor that it was going to be. So it kind of is pretty intuitive. It knows that. So we'll hit drug, pop that over, um, and we'll bond for only correct that. And then we'll also want some effect sizes. Maybe we'll want confidence intervals as well. Um, it's up to you. Okay, so we have everything set up. We have our drug with the three levels. We put in all our variables in the right spot. And then we set up our post hoc testing as well. So I'll just minimize that. Okay, so um, likewise before we have mean, median mode, SD for all three levels of our IV. We have our distribution plots for each three. We have our box plots. Now that it's kind of in a different format, it's going to plot these separately. That's OK. And here we go. So the F statistic for repeated measures ANOVA is going to look a lot like the between subjects ANOVA. Again, the math is going to be different, so the stats aren't going to be the same. But you wouldn't be running it both ways anyway. You would. Um, run only repeated measures if you had a within subjects design and only a between subjects ANOVA if you had a between subjects design. But here we have our degrees of freedom model and our degrees of freedom residual. So we have two and 10. Uh, we have our F statistic, that's our omnibus or overall test. So is there any difference anywhere between the three groups? So here it's 25.39 and we have our p-value. p is less than 0.001. So it's less than 0.05, there is a significant difference. And so that warrants the use of post hoc testing below. If this p-value is 0.2 or something like that, um, then we would conclude that all groups are the same, we would retain the null hypothesis, and then we wouldn't have to do any post hoc testing. But since it's less than 0.05, we'll go ahead and look at these post hoc tests. And that's going to be similar to what we saw before. So we have um, angsty free joyzepam, angsty free placebo, and then joyzepam placebo. Okay, so now we have kind of mean differences here. Um, we have confidence intervals of the mean difference. So is it between this and that number? Um, I just told that to calculate it. You could take that off if you wanted to. Um, I could take confidence intervals off, and it's going to recalculate them, and then it takes it off for you. We have our t-statistics, that's our t-test for each comparison, Cohen's d, and then our p-value. Um, so here we have significant differences between angsty free and joyzepam, um, no differences between angsty free and placebo, that's 0.46, and then 0 0.002, less than 0.05, differences between joyzepam and placebo. So then the interpretation is pretty similar um, in terms of looking at this this table of numbers um, between between subjects and within subjects. 
All right, so that's how you run a repeated measures ANOVA between these three groups, so a one-way repeated measures ANOVA. Here's our omnibus test, and here's our postdoc test. You can go ahead and copy this if you'd like into a Word document table. Copy to clipboard. All right. Okay, the last thing we'll talk about is regression. While ANOVAs deal with categorical variables, so something like males, females, different types of drugs, Regression works with continuous variables. So what's the relationship between the number of hours of sleep and a continuous measure of something like worker productivity the next day? When we have one variable, our linear regression is the same as a correlation between two variables. But we can also have multiple predictor variables or independent variables, um, just like we can have multiple factors in an experiment. So let's go over a quick example of how to actually run a regression and interpret the output. Okay, so the last test we'll go over here in this video is how to run a regression. And again, this is with continuous variables. If they were categorical variables, um, male, female, you would run an ANOVA. So for this one, we're going to use the parenthood CSV file. Um, we've used this before. Um, so go ahead and make sure you have that downloaded, and we'll go ahead and run this in Jasper. We will open up our data. If nothing else, you'll definitely know how to open up a data set because I've done this in every example. We'll go ahead and do parenthood. All right, so here's our data view. ID number. Um, Maybe this is the number of samples if we're just looking at Dan here. But, so maybe that's each night. Um, then we have a measure for Dan's sleep, how much the baby sleeps, and how grumpy is Dan, and yeah, the day, what day it is. So over the course of 100 days. All right, so we notice that these are all, all numbers. Um, there's no categorical variable here, so we don't see anything like therapy, no therapy, or the three different types of drugs. We just have all continuous quantitative variables. So I will spare you the descriptive stats for this one. Um, you would just run it the same way as you've always done. But we're going to go over to regression. And we're going to skip correlation matrix. And we're going to go right to linear regression. So we'll go ahead and click that. All right, so um, this is gonna depend on like what you want to measure, but for this case, we'll just um, say that the dependent variable is the number of hours Dan's sleep. So we want to see to what extent can we predict the amount of hours that Dan sleeps from the amount of hours the baby sleeps and also how grumpy Dan is. So we can treat these as our predictor variables, or we can consider them independent variables as well, even though they're not categorical. Um, so we can highlight baby sleep and Dan Grump, and we can enter them as covariates. So you will enter them over to the right. And let's see. We can leave our model the same. Statistics. Estimates, yep, that's fine. Leave it as model fit. Options, yeah, and we don't need to plot residuals. So we'll pretty much just leave all this as default um, once we specify our model up here. All right, so here we have our linear regression output. We have our model summary. Um, so kind of like in ANOVA, how they do an omnibus test overall. Um, there's kind of an overall model with regression as well. R squared, um, that's the amount of variance accounted for. That's similar to like a correlation value. Um, so you could report that in your APA style results section as well, the overall model, R squared. Um, and it's kind of weird because it has this ANOVA section. Um, how would I describe that? So pretty much an ANOVA is a special case of regression. It's just that those categorical variables are dummy coded. So a male, female becomes zeros and ones. Um, 
but it's nice to have that conceptual distinction that ANOVA is for categorical, regression is for continuous. Um, but you can think of this as just like your overall regression model, especially because we have multiple predictors here. And so we have P is less than 0 0.001. And so we would say the overall model was significant. P less than 0 0.001 and then multiple R squared is 0.836. And then getting into the meat and potatoes of it, uh, we have our coefficients. And that's going to show you um, the overall effects that baby sleep and Dan Grump has on how many hours of sleep that Dan gets. And so we have a couple things to pay attention to. We have our p-values for each. Um, you can kind of ignore the intercept here for now. Um, but we'll look at these last two, so baby sleep and Dan Grump, we have our p-values, they're both less than 0 0.05, so those effects are significantly greater than zero. Unstandardized, that's our beta coefficient, so it's going to be um, the letter B that stands for that. And we see these numbers, 0 0.084 and negative 0.081. And it's kind of tricky to interpret that and to see um, kind of what that actually means. And so the way to think about it is for every one increase in X, we have this increase in Y. And I know that sounds confusing, so let's kind of break that down a little bit more. So we can say for every one more hour that the baby sleeps, we see that Dan gets 0 0.084 more hours of sleep. Um, and we can uh, show that for Dan Grump as well. For every one increase in X, we get X increases in Y. So for every one increase in Dan's grumpiness levels, we can see that he gets 0 0.081 hours less of sleep. So that's kind of how you um, interpret these unstandardized coefficients. And getting at the fact that some of these measurements might be on different scales, it might be harder to compare the two, um, but it does calculate standardized coefficients for you as well. Think of that as similar to like the z-scoring that we talked about earlier in the other video. Um, and so we can interpret those coefficients as well if we wanted to compare across co um, model coefficients or different predictor variables. We have our t values for both of those 3.4, 16, um, and then p values, which we talked about. So, that is basically how you run a multiple linear regression. Um, again, I know this is going to sound confusing to you, you're hearing it for the first time, but this will supplement your textbook reading and um, all the resources I'm going to give you at the end of this video. Um, but that's just an overview of yeah, okay, now I'm understanding what a regression is. How do you actually go and do it and interpret the output? So that is how you run a linear regression in JASP. Okay, just a quick note on the APA style for some of these um, statistical tests, inferential tests. Um, for a t-test, you're going to put the letter t in italics, and in parentheses, you're going to put the degrees of freedom. You can find the degrees of freedom, or df for short, in your um, kind of analysis table from JASP. And then that follows your T statistic. Um, in this case, it's 3.7. Um, then your P value with P in italics, P equals 0.02. And then D, your Cohen's D um, in italics, and then 0.54 in this case. Um, for a correlation, you'll do it as R in italics equals your correlation, and then P value in italics. If your P value is less than 0.001, you just put the less than symbol. Otherwise, if it's not less than 0 0.001, you just list out the exact p-value um, with an equal sign instead of a, a less than. For ANOVAs, you have two degrees of freedom. You have degrees of freedom model and degrees of freedom residual. You can find those from your F statistic table, your ANOVA table from JASP. So you have F in italics, degrees of freedom one, degrees of freedom two, equals your F statistic and then p-value. And then for regression, you put your b-value, which is your slope coefficient um, in italics, and then that follows um, your 
T uh, T test statistic. And so that that part, that last end, is going to be the same as a T test. So T in italics, degrees of freedom, T stat, and P value. Um, so I know I'm just kind of grossly brushing over all of this, but just wanted to kind of get that in your minds um, as you move on to next semester about how to actually write some of these test statistics up when you write a results section in a paper or a homework assignment. Okay, so that's your kind of very brief intro on how to do a few statistical tests. I realized that I kind of glossed over a ton of stuff. Um, I crammed this into like a half hour video. Uh, the point here was not to be totally comprehensive. I just want to kind of get you all exposed to this kind of stuff so you don't have to go in blind next semester to your Research Methods 2 class. So if you're still confused about this stuff, that's definitely to be expected. So for this week and preparing for next semester, I want you to reread the chapters in the textbook. I also have a textbook on how to do statistics in JASP that's available, um, available to download on Canvas. That's going to be um, way more in-depth than this video, so definitely check that out if you're struggling for um, with this week's material or if you're struggling next semester. And lastly, there's another YouTube channel that is super awesome. It's called Statistics of Doom. She has a ton of videos on how to do pretty much anything um, using different types of programs. So definitely check that out as a reference as well. So for now, just be familiar on how to actually run the tests, how to copy the output, and how to make basic inferences about whether a test is significant or not. So thanks so much for tuning into this video, and we'll see you later.